Let's go to Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew chapter number 6. We have been exploring the, what we're calling the model prayer. You could call it the Lord's Prayer. You could call it the Disciples' Prayer. But we've been exploring this. We're in week number 7, and we probably have another uh, four weeks after this week. So we're more than halfway through. And we, two weeks ago, we were in verse number 12. Last week was Educator's Day, but two weeks ago we started verse number 12 and began a conversation on it. And I'd like to pick that up and continue that here this morning. So uh, let's read this uh, prayer. I remind you a little bit of the context of the model prayer. This is sandwiched right in the middle of a big sermon by Jesus. So chapters 5, 6, and 7 are all Jesus, one big sermon. And right in the middle is this, here's how you should pray, this model. And Jesus starts by saying you're addressing the Father, and you're, you have that relationship with him. And he starts by saying your petitions, first and foremost, are geared towards the Lord. They're not towards yourself. They're geared towards him and towards his glory and his name being made holy and his kingdom and his will being done. And that's intentional. That's purposeful. It it helps us to sidestep our selfishness and to dwell on him first. And then we get to some petitions that are about us. You get to give us this day our daily bread, which is a, a physical sustenance, Lord supply our needs petition. And then you get to two petitions that are spiritual in nature. They're for us, but they're spiritual. The first one of those is verse number 12. So let's read the prayer, and then we're going to read verses 14 and 15, which is a bit of a footnote on the prayer that Jesus gives. So verse number 9 is where we'll pick it up in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, after this manner, after this model, therefore pray you. Here's the template. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This morning we're going to dive into for a second time verse number 12 and specifically we're going to look at the end of that verse as we forgive our debtors. Uh, In case you missed the first installment of this sermon which was two weeks ago, I'm going to give you the condensed version of this. I would encourage you to uh, go to the website and listen to it. You can listen to the audio, you can watch the video, whatever you prefer there on your phone, on your computer. Um, I don't have time to repeat all of the foundation for verse number 12 in this petition, but I'll give you the 45-minute sermon in about four or five minutes. I'll condense it down in a nutshell for you. So this petition here, verse number 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, can be summed up basically in four words. And those four words that we gave two weeks ago are sin, forgiveness, confession, and forgiving. So if you were to just kind of compress it all in. You'd look at sin, forgiveness, confession, and forgiving. And my intention through this sermon, as well as any other sermon for that matter, but especially with this one, has been just to lay a very biblical theological grid for what the Bible says about these items. So as you can see, biblically, here's what this says. Not not necessarily to reason with you a lot or to, to employ logic with you much through this sermon, but to just give you biblically, here's what the Bible says. So I want you to see what the Bible says about sin, about uh, forgiveness, about confession, about forgiving. And there's a lot there. I don't have, I didn't last week or two weeks ago have time to cover it all, and I won't this morning, but we'll do our best to, to give it to you in a nutshell. So we've already covered two of those words, sin and forgiveness. So we first covered sin, calling this the problem, and that probably is, is a short sale on, on the problem. That makes it seem a little less than, than it actually is. It's a, a grave problem. Verse number 12 of Matthew 6 calls this debts, forgive us our debts. Verses number 14 and 15 call it trespasses. Both of those are synonyms for for sin. And the bottom line of the Bible when it comes to our sin is that sin makes man guilty before God and deserving of judgment. This is foundational to Christianity. This is the human dilemma, that we have a problem that we need to fix. Every worldview addresses that. You may call it a karma problem. You may call it a sin problem. You may call it uh, something else. But the bottom line is everyone realizes, as humanity, we have a problem. 
The Bible calls that sin, and the Bible says that sin is, in 1 John 3, sin is lawlessness is what it says. It's negating, trying to work your way around the law of God and trying to do without his law and do it your way. And the Bible tells us in Romans 3 that because of our sin, we stand guilty before God. And Romans 6 tells us that the guilty verdict is delivered, and that verdict is death. And that means both physically and eternally in hell. So that's the, the nutshell version of sin, that sin is a problem. It's, it's, it's breaking God's law. It flies in his face. It is, we stand guilty before him. There's a, a guilty verdict that's pronounced upon us, and this is our problem. Sin is the monarch of the world ruling the human hearts, and, and the effect of sin is deep. It is, the effect is, is both death here in this life, but also eternally, and the effect is also an unrelenting guilt in this life that nags us and that bothers us and that is constantly there and, and pervades our minds is this guilt as a byproduct of our sin. But that is, that is not the end of the story. That's a problem. But the Bible is also explicit that there is this forgiveness, this provision that's offered from the Lord. And forgiveness, biblically, is freely offered to us on the ground of Christ's death. That you, I, those that are in Natrona Heights and not in church this morning, those that are in Pittsburgh, those that are in America, those that are in Zambia, it doesn't matter. The forgiveness is offered on behalf of Christ's death. And because our sin debt is so large and we examine that, we looked at how big it is, and it's not just, it's, it's a moral debt that we owe. Because it's so large and so inescapable, forgiveness of this sin is the most basic need of the human heart. It's what, if we're honest with ourselves, we truly crave and we truly desire. And forgiveness at its core is God eliminating our sin. There's a lot of different word pictures the Bible gives of that, that he passes over our sin or he forgets our sin or he blots out our sin or he throws it into the depths of the sea or he separates it from us as the east is from the west. There's a lot of word pictures the Bible gives, but it's all essentially saying the same thing. Forgiveness of God is God eliminating our sin and God is a holy God who sees mankind in their sinfulness, and he is righteous, and he is just, and he will judge, but he's also merciful and patient and loving. Micah 7 tells us that we have a God who delights in mercy, who it joys him to give mercy to us. And all through Scripture, you see God as a God of forgiveness, and you see that through this forgiveness, who remember our sin no more, and this forgiveness is made possible only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ and what he did for us. And we covered this thought, and this is the, the crux of verse number 12, that forgiveness that's offered to us is twofold, or there's two aspects to forgiveness. There is this biblically, there's this judicial forgiveness that's, that's offered in light of our sin and being guilty before God. And this judicial forgiveness is what we called it. You could call it something else, but this is that as we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and put our faith and trust in Him, Romans 8, Hebrews 10 tells us that we are declared righteous. We are forgiven our sins, past, present, and future. That we are justified, is the Bible word, that we're made right with Him. Now, I have right standing with God based on what Jesus Christ did for me and my faith in Him. And so now I know that I escape hell and, and enter heaven, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done, that now I, I am, I'm no longer separated from the love of God. Now nothing, Romans 8, can separate me from the love of God. There's nothing in the world because I am adopted into the family. I am forgiven my sins. I am, I am saved. Christ was offered as a sacrifice once and for all, Hebrews 10, and he sits down at the right hand of the Father, and now we can place our trust in him, and it's done. Forgiveness of sins, it's over. And that is the greatest truth in all the Bible. That's what it's all about. Jesus Christ redeeming mankind that a great God loves some pretty terrible people. And he wants to save them from their sins and forgive their sins. But if that's all there is to forgiveness, then it poses a quandary for us. If that's all there is, then you come to Matthew 6, verse number 12, in this prayer of forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and you naturally ask the question, if my sins are forgiven, remembered no more, past, present, and future, they're all done, I'm justified with God. Based on what Jesus Christ did for me, then why would I be praying, forgive me my debts? Aren't they already forgiven? Aren't they already taken care of? Why would I be praying this prayer? And you may say, well, maybe it's a prayer that's designed for an unbeliever. 
This is someone coming to God and, and approaching him and saying, Lord, I'm wrong, save me. And that's, that's not accurate. The Bible is clear that this prayer it starts with our Father. It starts with those who have a relationship with the Lord. And you can see the spiritual nature of the prayer. It's not given for an unbeliever. This is a template for Christians of, on how we should pray. So what are we doing asking for forgiveness of our sins if we're already forgiven, if we have judicial forgiveness biblically? Why would we, why would we pray this? Well, the answer is what we would call parental forgiveness. And you see this illustrated in Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. 1 John 1 is one of the best places you see this illustrated. Where John, and you understand 1 John, he writes his audience as Christians. He says, I, I, write, to, I write these things at the end of, of, of chapter 5. I'm writing to you that, that believe that you may know that you have eternal life. John says, look, my whole book was written to Christians so that you would have assurance of your salvation. So John, to his audience of Christians, says... In 1 John 1, we have fellowship with the Father. We know that. We have a relationship with him. We have fellowship with him. We love that. And I'm writing these things unto you that your joy might be full. So Christians that have fellowship, I'm writing to you that your joy may be full. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Verse 9 of chapter 1 is, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What's, what's John saying? John is saying, that part of our relationship with the Lord after we're saved, after we're a Christian, part of our relationship with the Lord is this confession of sin and this parental forgiveness. That we're saved, but we still, we still wrestle with wrongdoing. We still mess up. We still fall down. We still do wrong. And as such, we need to go to God continually and say, I was wrong. Forgive me. Restore this severed relationship. If you have children or grandchildren, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Your children or your grandchildren may disobey you or may lie to you or may do wrong or may do something that is completely outrageous. But you don't think for a second, I'm going to disown you and you must change your last name. You don't think for a moment that you're going to lose that relationship with me at, at, at its whole. No, you don't. And, and part of them being your grandchild or your child is, is really almost a guaranteed forgiveness. If they'll just come to you and say, I'm wrong, forgive me, mom and dad. But... When they do wrong, when they lie to you, that does sever the relationship of sorts. That does make it awkward. That does make the conversations different. And when we do wrong, or even parents to kids, sometimes we mess up, don't we? And we have to go to them and ask their forgiveness and say, I was wrong, and make that relationship right again. And that's, that's what Matthew 6, verse number 12 is getting at, this parental forgiveness that we're saved, we have right standing with God, we're adopted into the family, but part of our prayer lives continually should be that we go to him and, and confess and say, I need your forgiveness, I need to be cleaned up. So sin is the problem, forgiveness is the provision, and that's both judicial and parental. And with that in mind, we come to the back two words and the core content of today, which is first, confession. Confession is what I would call the plea. And this word, confession, is the best word that summarizes Matthew 6, verse number 12. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and the footnote in 14 and 15. Confession is something, as many times in Scripture, you'll find that we're given instruction that is completely against the grain of our nature and against the grain of our culture. And confession certainly fits that mold. This is something that is antithetical to the day and age that we live in. You say, why is it antithetical? Because at its very baseline level, confession admits that there is right and there is wrong. You cannot confess your wrongdoing without an attestation that there is right and there is wrong. And this is something that is entirely against the cultural narrative of our day and age. It's not just that, oh no, that's not right or that's not wrong. At its baseline level, we now live in a, in a day and age where through our universities and through many, many, of, uh, many of our professors that now it's, it's all relative and there really isn't even a right and wrong. There isn't a transcendent moral order, what theologians have called natural law. There isn't something, there is not a standard that everyone all over the world can be held to. That your morals or your what's right or what's wrong, that's all a byproduct of your society. That's the majority rules. If, if they think that this is right, then okay, great, that's good for them. Our culture's different. If they think that's wrong, good for them. Th th this culture's different over here. That's, that's the day and age that we live in. That's what our young people, in many cases, are being trained in. That there is no right and wrong. And the solution, the world's solution to guilt nowadays, is 
don't have guilt because you shouldn't have guilt. Because you're not wrong. As a matter of fact, if someone's telling you that they're wrong, put a guilt trip on them. Tell them, who are you to tell me that I'm wrong? That's right for me and that can be right for you. Don't point your finger at me and be intolerant of me. You're wrong. Shame on you for telling me that I'm wrong, that there's some sort of standard that I should be held to. Right? Isn't this where we're at nowadays? This is just the fact that there is right and there is wrong is completely contrary to our culture. That I can do whatever I want just as long as I don't hurt anybody. We've all heard that, right? So at its core, confession flies in the face of that and says, no, 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 no. There is right and there is wrong. And confession is an admittance, not just that there is right and that there is wrong, but it goes deeper than that. And it flies in the face of our pride and it says, not is in the abstract, there's right and wrong, but I'm wrong. Not just that it's out there that someone else could be breaking the law, or someone else could be doing wrong, but confession at its core is, I am wrong. This is not, and this is not anything new. If we think that we're, we're unique, you know, we've, we've reached the, the, the climax of, of, of intellect and culture, that our culture, we're, we've reached this point where we don't think there's right and wrong. That's not anything new. This is something in the first century that John addressed. I just quoted a moment ago. I'll put it on the screen for you. First John 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So John says there is a confession. There is an admittance of wrong. There is a cleaning up that you need. But then what's he follow that with? Verse number 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. What's John saying? He knew in the first century there would be people that would say, I don't have any guilt. I don't have any wrongdoing. I don't have any sin. I don't have anything that I need to confess. So that's not, that's not new. The Bible addresses that, that train of thought. But in our confession, there is this admittance that there is right, there is wrong. There is a natural law. There is a moral order from God. And... I have broken that. I am wrong. I admit, I, I confess, I admit that I am, that I'm the guilty one. And if you think that I'm exaggerating this, like this is so difficult for us and I'm, I'm, I'm pushing it a little too far, consider for a moment, how difficult is it for you to get your children to admit when they do wrong? Isn't it? I have a three-year-old. He will, he will do something. I mean, he will take the toy from his sister, hold it. It's a pink bunny. He'll be holding the pink bunny that he just took to, from her. I just gave it to her. Brennan, give that back to your sister. I did not take it from her. Put it right to my face. He's tr- at a three. It's, bi- it's baked into him that he does not want to admit that he's wrong. And it doesn't change. Four, five, six, 15, 50. That doesn't change for us, does it? That we don't want to confess. Ever see a movie? All movies we've made simple. People just confess, right? This person's charged with a crime. I confess I'm guilty at the end. You know, that would be, be it. But it's never that. No, they, they, no I, I'm not guilty. And you go through trial and you go through all the rest of it. That's us. I can remember, I can give you many stories from childhood where I, where I failed to confess my wrongdoings to my parents. But one, one six in the forefront of my mind, I was probably 10th or 11th grade. And... Um, my, my mom was out of town for some reason. I don't know why she was out of town. It was very irregular if she was. And it was summertime. My dad was, was working late. And it's about 10 o'clock at night. And our, our neighbors come over. And they tried to pull some prank on us. I don't remember exactly what it was. But they tried to pull a prank. And the bottom line is now it's 10 o'clock at night. There's a bunch of boys on the porch and no parents at home. So that's, that's a recipe for disaster right there. So it's me and my two younger brothers. My older brothers are out of the house. And then two neighbor boys. So there's five of us. And we decide that we want to go, you know, cause some ruckus and have some fun. And, and in our mind, throwing eggs at cars would be a lot of fun. So we decide that let's do that and let's, let's go throw some stuff at cars. So we thought we're going to be so smart, we're just going to do it from our own driveway because we know if someone says, you did that from your own driveway, we'd be able to say, what idiot would do it from their own driveway we're not that dumb. That was some, we can just, we can play this up, you know. We don't have to wander down the road. So we had a bit of a wood line there where we could hide in the woods. And our house was up a hill, kind of offset. You couldn't see the house from the road. So we get in the wood line and cars start to go by. And we start to lob eggs and, and things at them. And uh, we're laughing it up and having, having a good time. 
until a car comes to a screeching halt and starts to yell. We realize it's one of our neighbors, Mindy, who's probably in her 20s. And she begins to scream and yell and yell. And so we, in the dark of night, we take off up the hill. We go in the house. She comes up the hill, bangs on the door. We come out, Mindy, I, we don't know what you're talking about. Why would we do that from our own driveway? That's ridiculous. It's, it's those other kids down the street, blah, blah, blah. Mindy decides that that's not good enough. She wants to call the cops. So she does. And we didn't know she called the cops, but the cops show up to our house. So we begin to lie to the police officer. And while we're lying to the police officer, my father pulls in the driveway from, from a late night of work. And we, he be, the police officer begins to explain, because certainly we couldn't explain. We don't know what's going on. We're just a body in our own time in the house. And the police officer begins to explain. And we, we promise up and down, one side or the other. It was not us. It was not us. And we just, we lie and we lie and we lie. All the children in the room, this is a bad example, okay? Pastor Mark, bad example. <laughs> We lie, lie, lie. I'll never forget my dad that night. He looked at us and said, boys, I may not, may not be able to prove that you did wrong tonight, but one day you will tell me the truth. No, dad, no, dad, no, dad, no, dad. And probably once or twice a year after that, for years, he would bring up that story and say, one day you're going to tell me the truth. One day you're going to tell me the truth. One day you're going to own up to that. One day, and finally, probably middle of college, five, six, seven years later, I got tired of lying to him. Because he would ask and it'd be like, what are you going to do? Tell the truth or just, you know, lie again? So finally one day we owned up and we confessed, dad, we did it. We're guilty, we're wrong. But it took us years. It took us years. And that, that's us. As humans, we're people that beyond just right and wrong to admit that we are wrong, this is difficult. To come into the joy of forgiveness necessitates us to go through this low door of humility, to to check our pride and to say, I'm wrong. And what you find is that this is intensely biblical. The characters in the Bible that we admire, that we love, that we look to, oftentimes say just this, I'm wrong, I'm a sinner, I did wrong, Lord forgive me. You find in Proverbs 28, and you can put these in, in the margin or in the notes of your Bible, Proverbs 28, he that confess or covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh him shall have mercy. Second Samuel, David comes to the Lord, and his heart smote him, and he, he said, I have sinned greatly in that I have done, and now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. What's David doing? He's owning up to it. He's confessing. I'm wrong. Isaiah, then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. He's attesting, I'm wrong, I confess. Daniel, a Daniel, a man that we look at and say, man, there was, you don't even see wrong in his life really. But you find in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel says, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people. Daniel says, part of my prayer life was I would confess my wrongdoings. Luke 5, Peter, Simon Peter saw it, fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Luke 18, you find the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee goes to pray chest puffed up, head lifted high, looks at the tax collector and says, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like that guy. And the public and the tax collector comes and says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, which one walks away justified? The tax collector does. The one who came and confessed humbly that I'm wrong. I'll put a verse on the screen for you, 1 Timothy 1. Paul writes, Paul, we say one of the greatest Christians, one of the greatest missionaries that, that have ever lived. Paul writes to Timothy and says, this is a faithful saying. It's worthy of all acceptation. Je or Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And amen to that. But then he adds this, of whom I'm chief. Let's take all those sinners, put them in a tribe. I would be the chieftain. I'd be numero uno. Paul's not using hyperbole, I don't think. I think in his own mind, he is confessing openly, saying, I'm wrong. I struggle. I've sinned in my life. I had sin in my life. I'd still do. This is, this is essential to our prayer lives and to our Christianity is this confession of sin. And this confession of our sin is an antidote to our moral hardness. I can promise you this, if, and you know this to be the case if this, if this hits home for you. A Christian who does not regularly confess their sin and say, Lord, I'm wrong, forgive me, pick me up, clean me up, help me. A Christian who does not do that is a joyless Christian, guaranteed. It begins to harden your heart. It begins to, to, to morally concrete you. 
And the joy begins to ooze out of you as you cease to confess your sin and make that relationship right with the Lord. So what is confession? Confession at its, at its core is agreeing with God. That's basically what the word means. It's the Greek word homologeo. And it means, God, you say I'm wrong, and I agree with you that I'm wrong. And I come to you and I tell you that. I ask for your forgiveness. I repent of it. Change me. I don't want to pick it up back up again. And this is what we as Christians, according to Matthew 6, verse number 12, this is the petition that we're to pray. This should be a daily, integral part of our prayer lives is this confession of sin that we bring to the Lord. And we say, Lord... I give it to you, I confess, and not in a big general ball. Not in a, Lord, forgive me of all my sins, moving on. But naming, God, I was wrong here. I should not have said that. Would you help me not to? Lord, I, I did that. I don't know why I did it. It makes no sense to me, but forgive me of it. Specifically, naming it, saying it, here's what it is. And here's why, because when you, when you name something specifically to the Lord and you ask for his forgiveness and you say, I'm putting it down, forgive me, help me with it, it's much more difficult for you the next day to pick it back up and start to do it again. And this is why we like to name our sin in a big general way. Lord, just forgive me of all my sins. Because we know in the back of our mind that there may be that, and there may be that, and there may be that, that I fully intend to tomorrow or the next week or the next month to pick that back up again. But when we confess in a very specific way, here is where I'm wrong. And it may even be that you confess that, Lord, I'm confessing this to you. I agree with you. I'm wrong. I want to turn from it. But, Lord, I'm struggling to turn from it. I have an attraction to that. I have this desire to do it again. And God, change my desires and help me with that. When you do that, the renewal of your mind and the internal process begins to change and the Lord begins to work, that relationship becomes mended and that joy is there again because of the daily confession of our sins. And this is what the model prayer teaches us, that part of our prayer lies. First, there's this petition for physical, give us as they are daily bread, Lord, meet my needs. But then there's two spiritual, and the first spiritual is, Lord, forgive me my debts. I admit, I confess, I'm wrong. Forgive me of them. I don't remember exactly if it was Lester Roloff or not. It was a preacher of yesteryear. I want to say it was Roloff. And his habit was to write his sins down in his prayer time on a, a strand of toilet paper. And then when he was done, he would wad them up and throw them in the toilet and flush it, and they would go away. And that was his physical reminder that I confess my sins, I'm forgiven, they're gone. I don't know what your process is or should be, whether you write them down, whether you say them out loud, whether you say them in your mind in the privacy of your own prayer time, whatever it is, I don't care, honestly. As long as it is a part of God, I confess I'm wrong. This plea of, Lord, forgive me. I have accrued some debt. I am, I, I am doing wrong, and I want your help. Lastly, we come to the last word, forgiving. I would call this the prerequisite. This is, frankly... This and a couple other portions of Scripture that we'll look at, I wish, humanly speaking, that they weren't in the Bible because it makes it difficult, but they are. And Jesus says this, verse number 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And in case that wasn't clear enough and it needed explaining, and maybe Jesus is teaching his audience and he sees this befuddled look on their face and he can tell they didn't just get what he said, so he adds this footnote to the end of the Lord's Prayer. He says amen, and then he says, verse number 14, just to make it explicit. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, I don't have a lot of time this morning to spend on this point, and that's for a couple reasons that I won't dwell too long. One is just the amount of time I have, and secondly is uh, on Sunday nights, just about a month or a month and a half ago, we spent four uh, Sunday nights, probably a total of an hour and a half to two hours in total, talking about forgiving one another. If that's something that would be of interest to you, write on your connection card, send me the forgiving sermons, and we'll email them to you. So I, I'm not going to dwell too long because many of you, you got that, but I, I will cover this in, in a, in a high-level way. Forgiving others. This is biblically a prerequisite 
before parental forgiveness is offered to us. It's not biblically a prerequisite before you're saved, judicial forgiveness. This prayer is a prayer of someone who's already saved, who already knows the Lord. But then for this relationship to be mended, they, they come, we should come, and ask for forgiveness, but understanding that before the vertical relationship could be made right, the horizontal relationship should be made right. Forgiving one another is something that is commanded biblically. And if we do not do it, it's scary if we don't. The Bible is very clear Amen. that when we harbor bitterness and, and resentment and, and unforgiveness in our hearts, that that is a recipe for disaster spiritually. Biblically, we are commanded to do it. I read recently of Dale Carnegie who went to Yellowstone and they, uh, they had this tour thing where you could feed grizzly bears and it was you would put out some food and some trash and different things and then you would go stand off a ways kind of in some vehicles and from a distance you would watch the grizzly bears come eat the food so the tour guide is taking them and he's going to explain here's what's going to happen explain the grizzly bear it's monstrous and really has almost no natural enemies you know a kodiak bear could wrestle with it but a grizzly bear nothing would want to take on a grizzly bear yada 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 so they're standing and sure enough they put the food out and a grizzly bear comes begins to eat and wouldn't you know it, there's this black and white streak that kind of runs across the plain and goes right up to the food where this grizzly bear is, and this skunk begins to eat alongside the grizzly bear. And then the skunk runs over to the grizzly bear, and he begins to take his food from him. And, and he's almost impudent. He's just taking the food and, and eating it. And the grizzly bear does nothing. He sits there and he lets the skunk take his food. And he lets the skunk eat his food and he kind of wanders away and tries to eat some other food. And Carnegie looked and he said, why in the world that grizzly bear could destroy that skunk? Why would he not? So the answer is simple. There's a very high cost for getting even. And in our, our lives, when it comes to someone who offends us, who hurts us, who's making us suffer, that we should forgive but we don't want to forgive, there's a very high cost of getting even. Us being bitter, us refusing to forgive, the Bible tells us that that is a scary place to be. So why is it a scary place to be? Well, first of all, you're, you're negating what should be the character of a Christian. As a Christian, we're little Christ. We're Jesus followers. And the Bible is abundantly clear that Jesus Christ has forgiven us, and so too should we. That he has forgiven us. It's God's nature to delight in mercy. So that now should be ours. Matthew 5, Jesus tells him. This is in the same sermon as, as the model prayer in Matthew 6. And he says, I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, let them off the hook. Don't, don't be bitter against them. Don't be mad against them. Don't declare war on them because of what they did or what they said. After all, we are the forgiven, so we should be dispensers of forgiveness. This is what Ephesians 4 tells us. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Colossians 3 tells us, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So as Christ was our pattern, our model of forgiveness, now it is our turn to take that and to reciprocate that and to offer forgiveness to other people. Isn't this what Jesus does on the cross? They mock him, they scourge him, they crucify him, they're there at the cross, and what does he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is as Christians, this is our responsibility. This should be our, ca our character, our nature. An unforgiving Christian is, is an anomaly. It's something that, is, that, that should not be. It doesn't make sense. So it's part of who we should be as a little Christ, but beyond that, this is something that delivers us from chastening. Refusing to forgive biblically is wrong. Anytime you choose wrong and say, I'm going to have it my way and not do it God's way, you are a prime candidate for chastening. Not because God doesn't love you, but because he loves you. Hebrews 12 tells us that. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So when you choose to not forgive and to harbor those feelings and to let that anger go below the surface and fester and boil up, now you are a prime candidate for chasing, which is a scary place to be. And beyond all of that, I could give you many more, but probably most importantly is that this is necessity 
for you to have parental forgiveness in a right vertical relationship with God. The Bible is clear that this is a prerequisite. You want to confess? You want the relationship to be restored? You want there to be forgiveness? Then you must forgive others as well. 2 Corinthians 2, verse number 10. This is a, a scary verse, but I'm glad it's in the Bible. Paul writes to the Corinthians and says this, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. What's Paul saying? He's saying, hey, I'm just, I'm just dishing out forgiveness. I'm, I'm not harboring these feelings. I'm not, I'm not getting messed up in that stuff. Why? He's going to tell us in the next verse, verse number 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. What's Paul saying? He's saying when we choose our unforgiveness, suddenly Satan has the advantage. And that's probably because now our relationship with God is not right. Our joy is severed. We can't walk with him. We can't have the relationship that we need there. So now Satan has the upper hand. So any time in your Christian walk where you are refusing to follow the model of Jesus, where you're disobeying the Bible, and now you're a prime candidate for chasing, and Satan has the upper hand on you, that's a scary place to be. And Jesus says in the model prayer that we should forgive us our debts, yes, as we forgive our debtors. Before I ask God to forgive me, I'm going to make sure that my horizontal relationships are intact. I'm going to make sure that those are right. Some of you, this may start, it may be making sense now in your, in your head. You may say, Mark, I, I mean, I'm a Christian. I come to church. I, I pray some. I read my Bible. I'm trying to do my Christian walk. I'm, I'm really, I'm working at it. I'm trying. But the, the joy that should be there, that should be part of my Christian walk, it's missing. I can't find it. I, I feel like my, my walk with the Lord is dry. I feel like it's stale. I feel like it, it's this grind and this routine. And frankly, I don't like the routine. Can I suggest a problem possibly? Maybe it's because you don't consistently go and confess your sins. And say, Lord, here they are. I lay them down. Change me. I, I don't want them anymore. You say, well, I do that. Not, not in a general way. I go and I confess my sins, but I still can't find the joy. Well, back up a step. Have you forgiven others? Because Jesus says, if you don't, then this isn't getting right. And that, you're not going to find that joy without it. That is essential. That is a prerequisite for this relationship to be intact, is that you are doing this for other people. You say, well, then how do I do that? Well, first and foremost, you go to God and you say, God, Forgive me for my unforgiveness. I realize this was wrong. I realize that I should be, and, and it's tough for me, and, and, and I struggle to do this, and help me with it, and turn it over to him. And then if it's appropriate, you go to the other person. And you tell them, look, I, I, I want to ask your forgiveness because I was harboring feelings in my heart, and, and I need to let you know, and would you forgive me? I've, I've forgiven you. Doesn't mean that you always have to. If they don't know that that's, that that's there, that that's part of your life, that you don't necessarily have to go to them. But if they do, if it's out in the open and they know they've messed up and you've, you've been a knucklehead and you've been avoiding them and you've been, you've been jabbing them every chance you got, you declared war on them, go to them. Say, look, I forgive you. I'm done with this. I'm putting it down. I had someone this morning, I had no idea, after the sermon that came up and said, I need you to forgive me because I hadn't forgiven you. I had no idea how to forgive the person, but I had so, so lay it down. Give it to God. If you have to go to the other person, go to the other person, but do it. Because this will not be right until you do. And this is not just, this is not just Matthew 6 where Jesus teaches us. Matthew 5, he said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. What's Jesus saying? Essentially the same thing. You give mercy to other people, and, and now you get it from God. James 2 tells us this. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. What's, what's James saying? He's saying when you refuse to give mercy to other people, you are now a prime candidate for God to unload his chasing on you without any mercy of his own, because you're refusing to do it. In case this isn't clear enough, I want you to go to Matthew 18, and we'll end today with Matthew 18. I think Matthew 6, verse number 12 is clear enough. 
If that wasn't, certainly verses 14 and 15, the footnote, make it even more clear. But if, if that doesn't suffice, and you think that there still may be some way to wiggle out of this, we'll look at Matthew 18 in a parable. Look at verse number 21, right in the middle of this chapter. Peter comes to Jesus and he asks him a question. Peter says to Jesus, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Peter thought he was being magnanimous. The, the Talmud tradition was that you would forgive three times. That was the cap. You had to do three, and then you, you were off the hook after that. So Peter more than doubles that. He says seven, and Jesus' response is, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And he's not literally saying keep a tally and count to 490, and then 491, you're good. What he's saying is, Peter, it's unlimited. <laughs> you can't cap this. There's no three, no seven, no number. It's unlimited. 70 times seven. And in case that wasn't clear enough, he tells them this, this story. Verse number 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 ta talent is about 75 pounds of, of a precious metal or of a, a liquid or something. So what this talent was of, silver, gold, I don't know. If it's gold today, that would be $12.5 billion. That's a, it's a lot of money. No matter what it is, this is a huge astronomical sum of money. So he owes his king a lot. Verse number 25. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. So he doesn't have, he can't pay the debt and says, sell him and his family away. And verse number 26, the servant therefore fell down, worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me. I'll pay thee all. Lord, give me some time. Verse number 27, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and he loosed him and forgave him the debt. Not just I'll give you an extension on your line of credit, but I'm going to forgive the debt, wipe it clean. Verse number 28, so this servant who's forgiven the debt went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. That's about three months wages. He laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. Same thing that he said to the king. And he would not. But he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw that was done, they were very sorry, and they came and told unto their Lord all that was done. And his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors that he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, and this is scary, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Jesus says the moral of the whole story is exactly what Matthew 6, verse number 12 says. It's exactly what verse number 14 to 15 says in Matthew 6. You don't forgive. This isn't right. This isn't getting right. Jesus says in a story form, who are you? Who are, who are you? Who am I to think that I am forgiven so much that I have so much sin and so much wrong and God eliminates it and he wipes it clean. He adopts me into his family. He gives me right sin. He does it all. He takes 12 and a half billion of debt and erases it. And someone's going to offend me for three months wages and I'm going to take them by the throat and I'm going to exact my pound of flesh and I'm going to get revenge on them and I'm going to refuse to forgive them. And Jesus clearly and plainly says, what a contradiction. How can that be? that if you have been, been forgiven so much, then forgive others. And that's necessary for your confession of sin and for you to be forgiven, that parental forgiveness to be intact, that you must forgive other people. This morning, our, our challenge and our lesson from this is extremely simple. Confessing our sin should be a vital part of our prayer life, not in a general cheap way but in a specific way of giving it to God and saying, change me, help me, I move on from it. You know what? The next day you may have to confess the same one, but keep on. 
And before you do that, consider those that have offended you and ensure that you let them off the hook. And I'm, not, I'm not trying to cheapen what they did to you. I'm not trying to cheapen what they said to you. I know it hurt. I know it was painful. I know it's something that it's just, it, it's, it's in your mind all the time. I know that. But biblically, as you confess your sin, you're reminded of how wrong you are. That it makes it easier to extend the same grace to other people. Do that. And the Bible says clearly that our job as little Christ, as Christians, our character should be to dispense the same forgiveness and to let them go. To say, I'm moving on. And that's necessary for our joy to be intact. That's necessary for our relationship with the Lord to be right. To give that to other people. Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors.